Hey everyone, welcome to the Baltimore County Fire Department EMS Academy. Uh, for those who I haven't met, my name is Sean Barinholtz. I am a anesthesia and ICU physician at Hopkins and an active member at Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company in Baltimore County. I also have the honor of serving as one of the associate medical directors for Baltimore County Fire Department. On behalf of Dr. Andy Pollack in the medical director's office, I know Dr. Sagal, uh, one of the other associate medical directors is with us tonight as well. Uh, on behalf of the EMS office, Chief Shenning, Captain Stewart, Captain Fitzpatrick, thanks for what you guys do. Thank you for what uh, you guys do every day and thank you for your dedication to lifelong learning. A big shout out to Ashley Brooks. Ashley is a volunteer, Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company. Ashley is running our uh, Zoom platform tonight. Uh, at some point, we'll let you know. Ashley will send out a link. If you click on that link, enter some information, you can get your MIM CEUs. So if you want your MIM CEUs, keep an eye out on the chat for the link and enter some information. Uh, tonight, we're super excited to have with us uh, Adam Murray. Um, Adam Murray is a trooper first class flight medic with Maryland State Police Aviation Command and firefighter paramedic with the Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company in Baltimore County. Adam started his career at the Cumberland Road Fire Department in Fayetteville, North Carolina in 2008. He then worked as a paramedic for Durham County, North Carolina from 2011 to 2016, prior to joining MSP. Adam, uh, Adam has been in the Aviation Command since 2017, working primarily at Troopers 2 and 7. He is currently assigned to the Aviation Command's Medical Training Section. Adam, thank you for your dedication to education. Thanks for being with us tonight. We super appreciate you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's uh, good to be here. Um, so, uh, yeah, Doc gave me a good introduction here. So um, I can uh, kind of breeze through the next slide, which is going to be our It's going to be actually my introduction, anyways. But uh, one of the things to just point out, uh, Doc's going to monitor the chat and try and get his, get, get my attention if I miss something. But uh, if you have questions, please type them in or uh, you know get, get a hold of me somehow. Um, part of what I want to do is uh, answer you know whatever questions you have about helicopter utilization and and uh, kind of fill in any of those gaps. So without any ado, let's get going on it. Um, so Doc gave you my bio. This is uh, kind of the typical career path for most of us as flight medics. Uh, Maryland State Police Aviation Command, we try to hire uh, paramedics with three to five years of ALS experience before they come to us. Now we do have some of our folks that have less experience when they come in the door. Um, so if you have less experience out there and you're interested, uh, just the way that it works is uh, you're competitively ranked prior to coming, coming in the command. And if you have less experience, you might get beat by uh, somebody who has more experience. Um, but uh, if you are, uh, you know, if you have their head on straight, you have a commitment to learning and you're a uh, kind of motivated person, it's not, it's not unusual to come in with, you know, a, a year of experience. And we do a lot of training in-house and we'll get you there. Um, hey, Adam. Basically, so there's something going yes. on with your slides. There's like a couple of dark boxes that are covering up key parts. I feel like they appeared when you and I were meeting originally and you turned on the chat. Yeah, I think that must be what it is. So I have the chat and then I have these videos. Let me, so why don't we are get rid of now? the chat? Why don't we get rid of the chat? I'll monitor the chat for you. And okay. Yeah, that's way better. All right, they're gone now. All right, good. Resume. Thank you. Sounds good. So the biggest thing, ask questions. Doc will monitor the chat and get a hold of me if there's a, if there's anything that comes up that you have a question on. So a little bit of background on the command. Uh, so the idea here is we were established in 1961, originally with the function of just providing airborne law enforcement, kind of like County Air or Fox Track. Um, in 1970, we moved into the EMS world. Uh, we're actually the oldest continue, continually operating medevac service in the United States. Um, the way the, the kind of urban legend and, you know, uh, kind of uh, folktale version of this is that, you know, Dr. Cowley, when he was founding shock trauma, um, wanted a helicopter to bring in patients, right? Because he had seen that work in Korea. Uh, University of Maryland at the time wasn't particularly interested in buying him a helicopter because that was an unknown thing in the, uh, um, in, in the United States at the time. And uh, he was able to make a partnership with the Maryland State Police. We decided, yeah, if you train us as paramedics, we'll uh, fly you patients. Uh, so a lot of our early days patients were uh, flown in this one down here on the uh, bottom second from the left or sorry, second from the right, that, uh, that little jet ranger. Um, 
they'd take up basically the entire cabin. And uh, we started with one helicopter and then they were added uh, all the way up to a max of eight at one point. Uh, Trooper eight was the, was our, you know, kind of the most, most helicopters that we had running. Um, and then Trooper eight went away after the crash of Trooper two in 2008. Uh, 2008, we transitioned to this new aircraft that you see down here in the bottom right. That's the 139. That's what most of our folks are familiar with now. So we have five separate mission profiles. Uh, medevac is the large majority of what we do. We are a yeah. You know, as a lot of uh, a lot of police services are uh, you know airborne law enforcement services that have the capability of transporting a patient. Um, we are a little bit more of a medevac service that has the capability to do everything else. Um, the nice thing is we do have the capabilities to do all those other things, right? So as I'll talk about later, right? If you need us to help find or uh, extract your patient from someplace, we can do that. Um, one of the very few places where you can go out, hoist somebody, and then immediately transition to a critical care role. Uh, and that, you know, and we can do that regardless of the weather conditions, whether it's daytime, nighttime, or whatever. Um, so our funding, this is an interesting point, and this comes from a little bit of our mission profile. So 80% of our operation is funded through the uh, uh, MSOF, um, and it comes from your vehicle registration fee. Where this comes to matter is that this is, uh, you know, right, it's tied to the percentage of missions that we do either way. Uh, but one of the other things that's, uh, you know, super important is that we don't bill for our services at all. So you never have to worry about with us uh, if your patient's going to get a $10,000 bill. That doesn't exist. Uh, we don't charge a dime. We are part of the public safety system in Maryland. So these are your helicopter sections. Uh, Baltimore section Trooper 1 is going to be obviously your, your go-to. Um, depending on where you are, Trooper 2 or Trooper 3 might be the backup to Baltimore for Trooper 1. Um, you can also get Trooper 6 coming across the bay sometimes. But the, the, point, of our uh, the point of our system and the way that our uh, bases are set up is that we try to have an aircraft to anywhere in the state within 20 minutes of call 90% uh, of the time. That's kind of our benchmark uh, that we go for uh, and we hit that pretty consistently. So uh, from the time you pick up in, in this, and I'll make this point about a million times in this, from the time you pick up uh, and, and request a helicopter, we try to be landing at your scene within 20 minutes. So the longer you take to make that call, the longer it takes for us to get there. We do have a fixed wing section. Uh, the King Air on the bottom is not there anymore. I forgot to take that picture out, but uh, that Piper Saratoga is there, mostly for emergent maintenance needs, uh, picking up parts and things like that. Um, our headquarters is uh, maintained at Martin State Airport. So uh, over in Middle River, um, it has all of our support staff and support structure. This is our guys taking, taking apart one of our helicopters. Uh, they are very maintenance intense. So every time they fly, a mechanic looks at them um, every time, every 24 hours that they fly, they get looked at again. There's certain things to get, you know, right. Uh, you can take it. It's kind of analogous to, uh, kicking the tires on an ambulance or, you know, checking the, checking the air, right. We go around and, and do certain checks at every, uh, you know, 24, 50, 100, 300 hours, uh, of flight time. And at the 300 hours of flight time, we basically take the, the thing basically gets taken apart to the frame. Uh, and inspect it, every single tiny component. Um, inspection takes a long time. Um, so we have, uh, you yeah, know, we have 10 physical airframes for seven bases, but uh, if we're out, if, you know, some of them are come across their heavy inspection at the same time, we may have issues with, you know, right, we may not have a spare available. It's just one of those things where, right, we have to take care of these things so they don't, uh, so, you know, we can operate them safely. So we have 24 seven operations, uh, obviously dispatched through Syscom. So all you guys need to do to get a helicopter is pick up the radio, talk to your dispatcher, your dispatcher will call Syscom. Now within that system or within that, you know, kind of game of telephone, there's a little bit of a delay. So as, as uh, right, and I'll push this a minute, you know, a million times, call early, call early, call early. Uh, as soon as you have the information that you need to request an aircraft, and we'll talk about that later, but as soon as you have the information that you need, please make that call. Um, that way we can, uh, we, we can get off the ground and get going. The longest single chunk of our response is this 10 minutes to get off the ground. Um, this is a big airframe, uh, it's significantly larger than most aircraft used for air medical operations in the United States. And it, it takes uh, a good amount of time to start up. We have two pilots, uh, have to start up both engines. You can't start them together. You have to start them in sequence. 
Um, we, we do our kind of final checks before we left off. Uh, so at any point, our, our average is about 10 minutes. Um, sometimes we can be a little faster. Uh, most sections, we are listening to your radios uh, you know, I, in the base as we're sitting around um, you know, doing whatever we need to do in the office. We've got the radios in the background for police and county, right? At Trooper 2, we have the radios for like four different counties running. So at any time, we might hear you guys pick up the radio and say, hey, I need a helicopter. We can start moving the aircraft, um, but it's not until Syscom calls us that we get formally dispatched. So sometimes if we do that, we can get off the ground in somewhere between, you know, five to eight minutes. Um, but 10 minutes is about the average. So our crew makeup, we've got uh, two pilots, two paramedics. So our pilot in command is a 2000 hour minimum pilot. Uh, second in command is a 1200 hour minimum pilot. Um, most of the, these are pretty high benchmarks, particularly the, uh, to be a pilot in command. Um, most of our pilot in commands are uh, former military. Uh, we've got guys that are night stalkers. We've got guys that have uh, flown the president around before in uh, Marine One. Um, we've got a very good group of very highly pilots uh, that will get us into places that we need to go. Um, the way this works in the, in the kind of crew configuration is we have our two paramedics in the back. We have a crew chief and a rescue technician. Um, technically, a, and kind of the way this works is the crew chief runs the mission and uh, kind of tells the pilot where we want to go and the pilot determines whether or not we can do that safely. Um, that's kind of the, 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 the division of labor, so to speak, the give and take. Uh, I say, hey, I want to go over there. And the pilot says, well, the, weather's, the weather sucks over there. I can't take you there um, or, you know, or whatever, um, whatever the case may be. This allows us to kind of check each other and uh, make the best out of all the experience that we have. So our crew chief, you'll also just see that uh, noted on our uniform sometimes is just plain flight paramedic. Um, so typically, again, we were looking for three to five years of ALS experience before you come to us. So this is the more senior of the two paramedics, um, but they are responsible for kind of all aspects of the mission. They are the ones that actually hold the RSI qualification with the state. Um, rescue technician, uh, it does stay on their EMT. We have two EMTs left. Um, and we have not, we have not been hiring anymore. That has been, uh, that's kind of a leftover from the transition from the old airframe to the new airframe. When we transitioned from the Dolphin to the uh, AW-139, which is what we are currently flying in, we doubled our crew size. Uh, and at the time that we did that, we just didn't have enough paramedics in the state police. Um, but like I said, those are, those are getting phased out. Everybody that we're hiring now is a full paramedic uh, and typically with experience. And so uh, we're looking at that, that rescue technician designation uh, might go away in the next few years and everybody would just be flight paramedics. But as, as it is right now, we use that rescue technician phase as kind of like a on the job training. So you're gonna work as uh, under, the, under the more senior paramedic. Um, there's not much way for you guys on the ground to tell the difference between the two of us. Um, if I got in the back with a rescue tech that I'm training, uh, ideally, I would not want you to know any difference at all, um, right? We train all of our rescue techs and all of our paramedics to a very high standard. Um, and so regardless of whether we come in the front door or the side door, whether we're running the call or not, uh, we try to work uh, you know, as a team and within the same framework, um, you know, kind of as, as each other. Um, the other main difference with the two roles comes down to our hoist mission. So in our hoist mission, the crew chief is actually the one who's uh, operating the hoist in the helicopter. The rescue technician gets lowered out of the helicopter. Um, that's because the crew chief typically is more senior, like I said, and uh, has a kind of more experience uh, talking with and dealing with the pilots. When we go into our hoist missions, uh, when we're over top of a target, the pilot can't actually see the target. And so everything that we do uh, is basically the crew chief telling the pilot like, hey, go a little farther forward and come a little farther back. Um, it's a very kind of complex balance uh, where we're trying to like uh, get that aircraft into position. And that's also a mission where we have a uh, very little margin for error, which is why our senior guy typically stays in the helicopter and uh, manages the hoist. So this is some of our equipment that you'll see us come in with. Uh, so we have these vests always uh, that you see up on the top right, um, have our uh, PFDs carry a, they carry a Heeds bottle, which is like a small air tank for us to get out of the helicopter if it crashes in the water. Um, we have night vision goggles. Uh, so the night vision goggles go in our helmets, um, but they're, they provide us with a huge safety margin for landing at night in uh, confined landing zones or performing our search and rescue or law enforcement missions. 
Like I said, I talked about this aircraft a little bit. This is the AW139. This is what we transitioned to uh, in 2012 to 14. Um, we have 10 of them, and uh, right, we, we keep seven of them in, in service at any time. Some of the key important technical specifications for this is you have an overall length of 54 feet. Um, so right, the 54 feet by 45 feet, roughly you think like a 60 by 60 area, we could put this helicopter in. Now, our landing zones are not that small. We would like 150 by 150, but that provides us uh, with a little bit of a safety margin. The other thing I want to point out is, yes. I'm having a hard time hearing what that is. Somebody with their mic unmuted and I'm trying to mute. Okay. Bear with me. All right, no worries. I just didn't know if that was a question. Um, okay, so um, overall height is 16 feet. Um, one of the things to remember is our, it's not actually on here, but our rotor disc uh, is about, so the actual rotor path is about nine feet off the ground at its lowest point. So this is an important safety factor for this aircraft. Uh, you don't have to crouch down when approaching it. I'll talk more about approaching the aircraft, but uh, unless we're on like an incline or something like that, you don't actually have to crouch down or do anything like that. I'd honestly prefer that you didn't uh, because I want you, uh, if you're approaching the aircraft with us, say to load a patient, I want you uh, looking up and uh, looking out for any sort of potential hazards. Um, so our max takeoff weight is uh, 14,991 pounds. So just under 15,000 pounds as we sit on the ground uh, in the hangar, we have about a thousand pounds of usable load. That all depends on the weight of the patients and uh, how, like, like the, the weather conditions. If it's hotter, we have a little bit less. Um, but so we have the capacity right from the field to take two patients, weight wise. I'll discuss a little bit more our considerations for taking two patients, a little bit, um, but it is something that we can do. We are capable of a two patient load. Um, Maximum speed there. So when we get into you know cruise, uh, we can go about 184 miles an hour, uh, 180 to 100 or 160 to 180 miles an hour to the hospital. Um, you know one of the things that we talk about is a right. We have that delay to get up and get going, right? With 10 minutes to get off the ground, 20 minutes to get off this to get to the scene. Chances are, once we leave the scene, we might right. What may be a 15 minute transport for you guys is a three to five minute transport for us. So that's where we really make up a lot of our time in this whole in this whole factor. And so if you can call us early, you can very easily make the time that it takes to arrive at the hospital by helicopter this very similar to what it would take by ground by ground ambulance. But the key there is you have to call us early. A couple of other things that we have on board. So we have this Westcam MX-15. That's the ball that sits underneath the nose. This is our day, night, and thermal imaging camera. This is what we use primarily for our search and rescue and law enforcement mission. So you can see down here on the bottom left, those are a couple of the uh, a couple st uh, stills from the screen itself. Um, on the bottom right, you can actually see the uh, the camera system itself. The uh, kind of mirror finish bay on the bottom is the IR lens. Uh, up on the uh, upper right is the narrow angle lens. And then on the left is the continuous zoom uh, daytime lens. So we've got three cameras packed into that little package. Uh, this can be very useful for, like I said, for assisting to help, uh, help you guys locate a patient. Let's say you're dispatched for like a, a hunter who's been shot uh, in an accident and they are somewhere in the woods and not 100% sure of their location. That may be one thing where you might wanna call early depending on how severe they sound over the radio and get our assistance in uh, finding the patient, right? If you call, call us early for that, let us know what we're coming for. We might be able to rig for a hoist and depending on the situation, this will be up to our crew judgment, but we might be able to insert one of our paramedics to start care until ground, ground resources arrive. It is something that we're capable of doing uh, completely independently of any sort of units on the ground. So even if this guy is all by himself in the middle of the woods, we have the option, we have the capability to find him and insert a paramedic and start paramedic level care um, before anybody else arrives. But the key there is we have to be called, we have to be called early. Uh, this is our tracker beam. Um, so this is our searchlight. We've uh, used this uh, a lot on law enforcement and search and rescue missions. We've also used this to provide lighting for fire department operations uh, on extended scenes where they can't get a light truck close enough. 
Um, it's been the thing that we've had to do a couple of times uh, for like dive team operations and things like that. Um, there's plenty of uses out there. If you think you have a use for us, and this might be, this might you know fall more on the incident commander, but if you think you have a use for us, call it. Worst we can say is uh, no, or maybe try back later. Uh, this is our rescue hoist. So again, we have uh, the hoist that we were able to lower one of our paramedics to start care with. Uh, so we have a 550 pound maximum load. Um, so that's usually good for the victim, our patient, or the victim, our paramedic plus uh, medical gear. Um, we have several devices. We, so we can, uh, we have a, what's called a screamer suit, which is like an improvised, or not improvised, that's the wrong word, because it's definitely uh, very professionally done. It's a, a commercial product called a screamer suit. Uh, it's like a, uh, a, a kind of hasty harness. We have a similar one on the rescue truck for uh, extrication out of a confined space, but it's like a, almost like a giant diaper that goes around the entire person. Um, we get hoisted all the time in it for training. Um, it's, a, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a very safe and secure device, and it's really good for patients that are ambulatory on their own. So if you've got somebody you just can't get out any other way, we can lower one of our medics, wrap this all around them in a, in a couple seconds, and then go right back up. Um, we also have a, uh, a pet bag, which allows us to take a standard backboard, place it into a, a litter uh, that, that is then hoistable to the aircraft. So this is our cabin. Um, so again, we're capable of a two patient load side by side. As you see there in that picture, the cabin in this case is set up uh, as, it, as if we would be doing an RSI in flight. So if we're gonna do an RSI or any sort of advanced care in flight, we a lot of times like to turn that litter to 45 degrees. That allows us more room at the head of the patient where our suction unit and our ventilator is. Uh, that also allows us to get more access to either side of the patient if we have uh, multiple providers working. That's also one of the reasons why if we have uh, a, very, a very critically injured patient, we don't, we don't want to take a second. Um, <clears throat> Because if we have two patients, that second patient will go on the floor, just on the uh, just right here on the other side uh, of this uh, of the stretcher. So we have uh, brackets that mount into the floor that will hold a backboard and secure it with seat belts. But uh, that takes up that ability to rotate that uh, that litter for us to provide additional care and flight. With two patients on board, this gets very cramped very quick. And uh, both of us is the right, the two paramedics on board then have to do uh, basically, you know, one, one medic per patient of care. So again, if we're, if we're taking two patients, we don't like either one of them to have any sort of critical airway issue uh, or any sort of like, you know, we don't want them to be crashing. Um, this kind of plays into, right, it, you know, we'll get a lot of times asked, like, can we take a patient? And what we're asking is their airway and their GCS. So, you know, if they're a GCS of five and you're bagging them, we're not taking two patients, not under normal circumstances. Um, that being said, I have taken two critical patients. Um, it is something that we, we don't want to do, um, but if we have to, we will, uh, if, if, if that's clear enough. Um, Right. In that case, there was not another aircraft nearby and this was it was two pediatric patients. So there's not another, uh, you know, transporting one by ground would have taken a significant amount of time. And we elected to just kind of bite the bullet and take it. Uh, and, you know, right, we weren't as able to do as advanced care as we would otherwise. In this case, we bagged both kids, uh, you know, right. One medic worked on one kid, the other medic worked on the other. Um, whereas either one of them might have been RSI otherwise had we had uh, the full space to do so. So it's just one of those things, it's a trade-off. If we crowd that aircraft with patients, uh, it's gonna be difficult for us to perform the care. So in ideal circumstances, if you have one that's critical, that's dedicated to one aircraft. Um, and then patients that are able to talk, able to uh, you know, protect their own airway, those patients will take more than one of. We do have two cardiac monitors. We have a full set of ALS equipment. We have everything on our helicopter that you have on your ambulance to include CPAP, nitro, all sorts of stuff for our cardiac patients. Um, I mean, we have everything. I think the only thing that we don't have uh, is Tordal, just because our, you know, right, we don't have any real business giving that to trauma patients. So we don't kind of bother carrying it. <laughs> um, other than that, I think uh, we have exactly everything that you, that you guys have on the ground. 
Um, so you know, we can take care of any sort of complex medical patient, or if you have a medical and trauma together, you know, we can take care of those patients, and we and we often do from particularly from outlying counties. The other biggest there question is, that we get, can, there, yeah, there is a question, Adam, about in the chat about whole blood or FFP. Uh, I'll get to uh, so I'll get to whole blood in a little bit. I have a slide for that. Uh, we do not have it yet. Uh, we are in. Um, hang on. I don't know if you guys can hear in the background. I was telling Sean I have to do some work on my house, and so I don't have a wall, so it's a little bit loud. Um, but um, we are working on a whole blood program. Uh, the protocol is uh, I've got a, a slide with it later on in the slideshow. Um, once whole blood gets in, uh, that will be a game changer. But it's one of those things where uh, we've been having just uh, you know right. We have to get the blood bank, the hospital, and us all on board and on the same patient or the same page. And while all of us agree that it is a good thing and we need to do it, um, getting everybody uh, on board is gonna take time. Um, all right, in terms of working out each agency's individual um, needs and, and, and coming together. So uh, I do know we're working on it. Um, it will probably, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, any minute now it'll get dropped on us, say, hey, roll out, right? We have all of the equipment purchased. Um, we just have to figure out how to get the actual blood itself. Um, so uh, that's being worked on by people, you know, above my pay grade, uh, but it is coming. That's why that protocol popped up into, into the uh, 2021 revision. Um, so uh, for weather minimums, uh, this is kind of what we use. Uh, so a thousand foot ceiling, three miles of visibility. Um, those are our VFR minimums. So we have two ways that we can apply VFR, IFR. VFR says visual flight rules where we can actually see where we're going. IFR is instrument flight rules. In that case, we're applying in the clouds and we can't actually see where we're going. We're required, uh, we're taking direction from air traffic control, which is telling us fly at a certain altitude for a certain distance and then turn and fly at a certain altitude for a certain distance, right? Um, so obviously, if we can't see where we're going, our missions are severely limited uh, into what we can do. So we can do these IFR missions um, at a ceiling of 800, uh, 802, but we have to take off from our base and then we can only go to certain hospitals which have a GPS approach built in so we can follow that GPS set of breadcrumbs down to the hospital. Um, and then we have to return immediately back to base. So um, those get difficult. What I would kind of say is if you're in Baltimore County, chances are we're not doing an IFR medevac. Uh, it's gonna take significantly longer to set up and um, it, right, it's just not gonna be viable because you'd have to get the patient to Martin State. And in most places in Baltimore County, it's just easier to go to a hospital. Uh, where these IFR missions occur a lot of times is the outlying sections. So for example, I can take off from uh, St. Mary's County um, you know, fly up into the clouds and fly all the way to shock trauma and then land there where there's no trauma center in that county or in that in that general region. Um, so that, that allows us to then access that facility. Um, key thing with this weather is uh, it matters whether uh, what the weather, weather is at the scene, the, at our base and at the hospital. So it can be clear blue sky at your scene, but if we're socked in with fog at our airport, we can't lift off to get to you. Um, same thing, it can be clear blue at my base and at your scene, but then we might have a thunderstorm sitting over the hospital. Um, a good example of this, we had a mission uh, not too long ago that I was involved in where we took off uh, to fly down and get a patient, lifting off from the, from the scene, right? So we had good weather to lift off from our base, good weather to fly to the scene, good weather lifting off from the scene, but we had some, it was like an afternoon where we had spotted thunderstorms. And so we we're like, we, we have a weather radar in the aircraft. We can dodge around isolated thunderstorms. And what happened is those thunderstorms could uh, merge into a big line, kind of wall of thunderstorms, which then cut off our access to all of the trauma centers <laughs> that we were trying to get to. Um, so in this case, right, we're making weather decisions. And this is, right, our, our destination is changing by the minute. Right? When we lifted off from the scene, we were able to tell Syscom, hey, we're going to go to one of three hospitals, but we have to look at the weather and figure out which one we can go to. Right? And this is one of those cases the patient really needed to be flown. Um, 
and you know we we stayed safe the entire time but we just you know it ended up being that we actually couldn't make a trauma center we had to make a uh, kind of um, emergency landing so to speak not necessarily emergency but uh, emergency landing is a probably the easiest way to term it um, at a non-trauma hospital get their assistance in stabilizing the patient and then carry on by ground. Um, so it's something that we can do, um, but right, that just gives you an idea. It's not always as simple as looking at the weather. I, I got clear sky. Some of our weather decisions change by the minute and they can change multiple times throughout the call. The biggest thing is please don't assume. If you think you need a helicopter, request the helicopter. If we can't go, we'll tell you no. Um, but request the helicopter and start making your plan to, to figure out how you're gonna to get to the hospital otherwise. Um, but uh, sometimes, right, it, it can look cloudy and it can look gray and not, and not nice, or it could be like raining, for example. We can fly in the rain as long as we can see in front of us. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, even with heavy rain, we can see and so we can continue flying. I've, I've flown in the rain. I've done medevacs, you know, where it's raining on us the whole time when we get drenched underneath the helicopter. Um, as long as we can see, we can fly. So don't don't just assume because it looks bad that we don't we're we're not going to be able to come out. Um, one other thing about that though is icing. We cannot fly in icing conditions. So if there's moisture in the air and it's below freezing, uh, we're not going to be able to lift off, even if it's nice and clear. Um, our helicopter does not have any sort of anti-icing equipment, so we will build up ice. It will accumulate on the airframe until it's too much weight and it disrupts the airflow of other things, and we ended up and we end up losing lift and uh, making a unscheduled uh, arrival at the ground. Um, so icing is not something that we can handle, but everything else we're good to go. So uh, I've harped on this a couple times. Um, call early. Call early. Call early. Um, one, you know, if I could snap my fingers and remove something from the vocabulary of fire and EMS across the state of Maryland, one of the things that I would love to do is, can you check the availability of the helicopter? Can you get me an ETA? Um, we are available. We're available 24 seven. If trooper one is not available, they'll send trooper two. And what they'll do is they'll come back and they'll say trooper two ETA 25 minutes or 30 minutes. And you're gonna be like, ah, that's too long. Cancel them. Right? By that time, we have not lifted off the ground. Chances are we're still pulling the helicopter out of the hangar. It is no big deal to call us. Right? And I, I, I harp on this because I hear this a lot of times, right? Hey, can you check the availability of aviation? Or can you give me an ETA on aviation? Um, and sometimes, right? I, I guess I, I think, imagine how weird it would sound if you arrived on scene and you had, a, or you know, you're en route to a call, it sounds like the patient might be trapped in a vehicle. And he said, hey, can you check the availability of the rescue truck? No, you just roll it. And if it's not needed, when you when the first arriving engine arrives, they go, hey, it's not a rescue, you put the rescue box in service. So I really want, you know, if you have that information, right? Let's say you have a pedestrian struck and they're saying right off the bat, that patient is unconscious, unresponsive. Even if nobody's on scene yet, you can start the aircraft based on that information. If you've got something that is obviously an alpha or bravo, right? Uh, you got a patient, there's a gunshot wound and he's shot in the chest. As soon as on the dispatch, you can start the helicopter then. If you arrive on scene and it's like a BB gun scratch or like a graze and you don't need a helicopter, cancel us. It's no big deal. We don't mind turning around, shutting it back down, putting it back in the hangar. I'd rather you have a very low threshold to request a helicopter early so that we can start that process of getting off the ground and getting moving towards you. That being said, so this is the protocol. Uh, category Alpha, Category Bravo, uh, you can launch a helicopter without any sort of console. Um, so for a Category Alpha, that's your GCS less than 13, BP, uh, systolic BP, uh, BP less than 90, respiratory rate uh, less than 10 or greater than 29. Um, or the need for ventilatory support. If you're bagging a patient, it doesn't matter. They, uh, they, they, count, as a, they count as an alpha. So if you're, if you're having to assist their ventilations, they're an alpha. Um, I would really like for everybody who's on a fire engine, everybody who's on a piece of emergency response equipment to know category alpha and bravo, right? 
in outlying counties, we even do our, our training with our own uh, our own troopers, right? And, uh, and the county law enforcement guys that if they show up on scene, they're the first in to secure the scene. If they've got, you know, central gunshot wounds, if they've got an unconscious person who's unresponsive, they'll say, hey, uh, scene secure. And oh, by the way, start the helicopter. Um, that's fine too, right? We don't need a paramedic on scene to determine this, at least to get the helicopter started. Start it early. If the paramedic, if the du uh, duty officer, if somebody gets on scene and says, this is why we're not flying this, cancel us. It's no big deal. Um, it doesn't come out of your paycheck. It doesn't come out of my paycheck. It is no big deal to start the helicopter early and then shut it down if we're not needed. Um, so uh, category Bravo. So the way that I like to think of this is like uh, B is in bones. So like uh, proximal long bone fractures, amputations, chest wall deformities, flail chest. Uh, one other important part about long bone fractures. So these are proximal long bones. So proximal on the limb. So these are your humeruses and your femurs. Uh, a radius and ulna or a tib or a tib fib are not proximal long bones. They're the distal long bones. So that's an important thing to remember as well. Um, I think of uh, other th uh, you know, other kind of pearls and pitfalls that we've run through on on this specifically with the um, decision tree. But the biggest thing is you know right call early, call early, call early. I can't emphasize that enough. So for Charlies and Deltas, you have to get a consult for this. Um, I would hazard to say that most places in Baltimore County, with the exception of like way up on the Pennsylvania line, uh, you can drive a Charlie or a Delta from almost anywhere in Baltimore County. Um, these are not the patient, I mean, these are patients that need to be evaluated at a trauma center, uh, but they probably, at least in the urban metropolitan area of Baltimore County will not helicopter transport. Um, that may change as our skill set changes, right? We're talking about blood, we're talking about adding ultrasound, we're talking about adding some other uh, kind of advanced procedures and things like that. If we start adding some of that stuff, uh, right, maybe, maybe this calculus changes. Maybe it's better to have us take a Charlie in because we can go ahead and start the ultrasound, do a fast exam on the flight in. Um, but that's, that's not where we're at right now. We have the same amount of uh, ability to care for as you guys and for the Charlies and Deltas um, you know, if you think as the paramedic on ground that it is going to be uh, clinically beneficial, by all means, we're happy to come out and take them. But uh, most of the time, they can be they can be transported ground, particularly within an urban area. One other thing to point out is that if you have a search and re uh, request and a hoist request, these are exempt from the trauma criteria. So you don't have to have a trauma category in order to request us to hoist your patient. Um, this sounds kind of dumb, but like. Sometimes we get run into that. We'll hear, uh, right? I've been at, at the hangar listening to the radio and I hear like incident commander say, hey, can you request, you know, Trooper 7 for a hoist? And the dispatcher comes back and says, hey, can you advise a category and priority? Right? You don't necessarily need that. Uh, we can hoist somebody who is uninjured. They're just stuck. Uh, sometimes we like hoist them up to the aircraft, fly the helicopter over to a safer spot than where they are right now and land. Um, as long as that's the safest thing to do and the most effective way to get that patient out, it's no big deal. We'll do it. Um, while I understand SAR and hoist requests are less common in urban metropolitan areas, right? We, a couple of years ago, we did a hoist from the 395 interchange uh, with I-95 in Baltimore City. Um, you know, in that case, a boat had run aground because it had run aground and tide was receding. Fire boats couldn't get to it until the next morning. They were too far to long line or do anything else. They couldn't walk out. And you know they had a patient that had a uh, uh, a medical issue and couldn't stay on the boat overnight without his medication. In that case, right, that's the situation we're in. Uh, we got a hoist, and so we came in and, and hoisted right next to right next to I-95. Um, so uh, I like to I like you guys to be familiar with these kind of cases because like right, think outside the box. These are our capabilities. It's up to you guys to call us in so that we can do it. For a landing zone, uh, ultimately, um, we like you to pick a landing zone. The better landing zone that you pick, the more likely we are to make it on the ground on the first try, which then avoids the delay of trying to move a landing zone and find one again. So 
we like you to pick a nice, easy flat, right? If it's up to us, they'd all be paved. They'd all be free of cars. They'd all be well lit. It would be fantastic. Um, but they're not all like that. Find the best appropriate, the, the best landing zone that you can. And the crew will ultimately make the decision whether or not that's appropriate or not. Sometimes we can see hazards from the air that you guys don't consider on the ground. Sometimes we can be like, hey, uh, that's a good LZ, except, um, you know, because of the way the wind is blowing, we have to come in right over this house and they've got a big tarp on their roof. We're worried about blowing their roof off as we come in to land, right? That, that sometimes has happened. The state claims adjuster is tired of hearing about things that we've destroyed with the rotor wash of this aircraft. Um, because, right, we, you know, it happens. This is a very powerful aircraft. It puts out a lot of wash with hurricane force winds. And so we have to we have to calculate that into our approach pattern into the landing zone. So pick a nice open flat spot. We typically want 150 by 150. If you're the landing zone unit, we want you to reference the air. So first of all, leave your lights on. Don't park under a tree. Um, sometimes we get, particularly in the summertime, we'll get units that will park in like a kind of a shady spot, but that also means they're directly under a tree. And so we're flying around. We're like, we don't see your lights anywhere. And then we ultimately come around and we're like, oh, there they are. They're like right next to the tallest tree around that's just hiding them. Try and park. I mean, if you want to park in the middle of the landing zone and then move once you see us, that's fine too, um, right? Parks in, a, in an area that we can see your lights and we can rapidly identify the zone. The brief for the landing zone unit should tell us uh, if there's any obstacles that you foresee. We're going to do our own brief. We're going to do our own scan of obstacles, but anything that you see. Uh, for the units providing patient care, we'd like a brief update. You don't have to give us the full information. We'll get us on the ground. Typically, what we want is the airway and their GCS. So uh, a good LZ update for me is like, hey, I've got a 30-year-old male uh, GCS of five. We're bagging and having to suction. That tells me almost immediately I'm probably going to come into an RSI. I can extrapolate all that from that tiny 10 seconds of, of information. Of information and then that frees up uh, us uh, our communications inside the helicopter to talk about getting the helicopter on the ground safely. Um, one of the, the important things to remember as you're talking to the helicopter is that we have uh, at the minimum of four radios going on inside of that helicopter. We have two air traffic control radios and uh, uh, two medical radios. All of them kind of have the capability to sometimes listen to more than one channel. So we have a lot going on, plus the four people in the aircraft trying to talk about the mission. Um, it is, it can get very busy inside that aircraft, particularly like in and around the Baltimore metro area, right? If we're on the, you know, uh, southwest side of Baltimore, we're right in around BWI. And so we might be coming in for a landing zone with airliners coming in on final approach to BWI coming right over our heads. Um, Right, things like that uh, complicate things from the uh, you know of the, the communications inside the helicopter, but it may not be apparent to you guys on the ground. It may just be that hey, we're talking to the trooper, but they're not talking back. Well, it might be that we're talking to somebody else on a different radio, um, and and we'll, we'll you know we'll circle back to you. So just uh, kind of be patient with us, but be brief and concise. Uh, that helps clear up uh, everything. As we come in. If anything looks wrong, if, if you see a hazard, if a car starts to drive into the landing zone, all you have to do is uh, key up on the radio, say abort, abort, go around, any of those things, we will pull power and we will get out of there. Um, once we get out of the LZ, circle around, we can discuss what happened after, uh, you know, afterwards and come in and make another approach. We can either mitigate the hazard or move the lane. Uh, one of the things that I like, I'll give kudos to Frederick County. Uh, Carroll County does it sometimes as well, but they put a, uh, as we come in on final approach, they will cease all, uh, all radio traffic on the talk group. So one of the things, so their dispatcher will say, hey, Trooper 3 is on approach, uh, hold the air until they're on the ground. Uh, that's helpful because that way, if somebody on the ground does need to key up and tell us to get out of there or uh, to abort our, our attempt, we can hear them immediately without getting stepped on. Um, I know this has been a thing that we've run into with Baltimore County in the past. Uh, sometimes they'll have us, uh, right? They'll have Trooper 2 en route to the landing zone and they'll put us on west. Uh, if we're on west, it is sometimes very difficult for us to get in what we need to, what we need to get in. 
um, right? We're trying to talk about the landing zone. Meanwhile, somebody's trying to call out at Northwest Hospital. Um, it can get super confusing um, with, with that many incidents going on. So that might be one of those things where you guys have to uh, right, know how busy the county is. If they're super busy, uh, you might have to request a talk group. That might be the safest thing to do. Um, we can and, and sometimes do take a ground provider. Um, crew will to make that decision. A lot of times it's whoever's lightest. Um, sometimes it's uh, whoever's got a particular set of skills that we need. We do take ground providers less often now that we have a ventilator on board. Um, it used to be the lightest EMT on scene was our ventilator. Um, and we would bring them along to bag the patient after we RSI them and, you know, take care of, their, uh, of them on the way to the hospital. The nice thing is now with the ventilator, we're more likely to take an extra ALS provider with us to continue to help provide ALS care. Um, sometimes that is super helpful, um, particularly to a patient that's crashing. There's a lot of things to be done. Uh, it helps to have that additional set of ALS hands. And so the nice thing is the ventilator frees up one of our sets of hands to, to take care of that. The other thing that's important is we like to land as close to the scene as possibly, uh, as safely possible. So uh, I really hate waiting, waiting in landing zones. Uh, sometimes it's, a, it's the nature of the beast that I can't, it can't be avoided. But uh, right, there's times where it's, you know, we'll land, we'll shut the helicopter down, and we'll be sitting there for like 30 minutes waiting on the waiting on an ambulance to get to a to to get to the helicopter uh, in the landing zone. In that case, I'd much prefer you land the helicopter significantly closer to the scene, or figure out a way to get transport for me and my and my partner to to come to the scene. Right, that significantly reduces the amount of uh, turnover time. If you think about it. If I can start getting the turnover from you as the ground medic and start my care as the, as the flight crew while the extrication is still ongoing, that then eliminates the need to do an additional handover once you arrive at the landing zone. If I can start care before extrication, right? Otherwise, you start care, you do all this stuff, you bring them to the landing zone, and now I have 10 minutes where I need to do my own assessment and basically start over and do any sort of treatments that I need to do. I can eliminate that 10 minutes by starting care early. So the biggest thing, I'd love, I'd love to land on the scene if I can. Uh, if I can't land on the scene, I wanna land as close as possible. And if it's gonna be a while before you get the patient out, I'd like you to figure out a way to get me to the scene. Whether that's uh, getting a utility from the station to bring us over, or uh, sometimes getting a police unit, that maybe there's a police unit that's working a perimeter or something like that, that, you, that can free up. Um, I've, I've ridden in the back of cop cars multiple times to uh, uh, over to a scene. You know, it, it's not a big deal, um, but we, we would really like to be there so that we can help you take care of the patient. So 150 by 150, uh, that's what we want. Um, bigger is better, right? Bigger gives us more options. Uh, it gives us more options, particularly if we have some sort of emergency. Um, but uh, you know we've we've landed this helicopter in some in some tight spots, um, but that's just one of those things. Uh, you know, 150 by 150 is what we want. Clear of obstructions, power lines, uh, right? We also have to consider the winds. So if we're flying, we have to have our nose into the wind as we come in. Uh, so you may say like, hey, there's a tower over there, but it should be out of your way. But because of the winds, it's right in our way. So just point out those things to us. We'll uh, we'll adjust and, and we can mitigate them as necessary. We want it to be relatively flat, uh, no more than five degrees slope. Um, we need to watch for pedestrian traffic and watch for vehicle traffic. When we land a helicopter, sometimes people come out of the woodwork. Um, we've landed on right. We landed one time on the quad of Bowie State University, right in between all the dorms. There was nobody out there because it was three o'clock in the morning. The minute we put a helicopter on the ground in the middle of a college campus. There then became uh, about 100 people very quickly. Um, so it's one of those things, just consider where people might come from, where they might come, uh, right? We've had cars drive at helicopters just because they want to get around the incident. If you're going to land us on the highway, both sides of the highway need to be shut down because otherwise, whatever side that we're landing on needs to be shut down at the minimum, but the opposite side, somebody will wreck because they're watching the helicopter. So shut down both sides. You can, re you can release traffic flow on a divided highway once we're on the ground, but then it needs to be stopped uh, again for us to lift off. We want a firm surface. If you wouldn't put your fire truck on it, 
uh, we don't want to land a helicopter on it. So if it's too muddy, if you think you driving your fire truck or your ambulance would get stuck, we don't want to put the helicopter on it. Uh, we're 15,000 pounds on four little tiny wheels. So if it is, uh, if it's soft, we'll sink right in. Um, so if there's been heavy rain, try and right, right, try and preferentially find paved or hard uh, or hard fields to land us. Um, we talked about landing as close to the scene as possible. We do have a large amount of downwash. Like I said, I've uh, we've damaged fences, we've thrown bleachers, uh, right? So look out for these things as we're coming in, so that you can avise us, advise us, and we can avoid them. But also. Be, be attention, be paying attention to these kind of things, right? The last thing I want is for us to be coming in, our, our rotor wash kicks up, kicks up an obstacle that then hits somebody, right? Um, so just uh, be very careful when you're looking for these items uh, to, you know, try and see anything you think would like blow, right? If you would tie it down, if there was a hurricane coming through, then you probably shouldn't land us next to it. Um, leave emergency light final push so uh once once we see you and we are like slowly coming into the landing zone you can turn them off one of the other things uh our pilots really don't like at night when we have right all the ambulances nowadays when you open a door the floodlights come on and inevitably those are aimed like right at the pilot's eyes with their night vision goggles so it's just one of those things uh if you can once we're particularly once we're down in the zone and landed if you can turn off as many lights as possible and prevent those lights from shining on the pilots Right, their their night vision and their adjustment of their eyeball to the night uh, is is super important for the safety of flight. And the the final thing is right throughout the helicopter EMS in, uh, industry, landing at the scene is by far the most hazardous thing that we do. If you look at their NTSB reports of medical helicopters that crash, a lot of them crash on scene flights. Um, we do almost 100% scene flights. So we are almost always doing the, what is the most hazardous thing in the industry. Um, your setup of the landing zone and you're working with us and your radio communications, you're looking out for these hazards significantly improves our margin of safety when performing these missions. So approaching the aircraft. Um, so when we're on the ground, you know, LZ safety is priority, LZ security. We don't want anybody approaching the aircraft if they have no business approaching the aircraft. Uh, so primarily you're gonna approach the aircraft with the flight crew. Um, the only time that we might tell you, right? I, I can't think of a time that I would tell you to approach the aircraft uh, without me, but you know, there's a, a couple of small little cases where I might tell you, hey, go get my pilot's attention and tell them like, for example, to shut down. Um, in that case, you might have to approach the aircraft by yourself uh, if you do that, approach from the front of the aircraft, make sure you're making direct eye contact with the pilots um, and that they wave you in before you, uh, before you approach the aircraft. There have been some times where we've been in the, in the ambulance, elbow deep in a patient, uh, and the pilots need one of the firefighters. They can key up the, the radios from inside the helicopter, but sometimes they just wave guys over. If you see one of the pilots waving you over, you can approach the aircraft, that's allowed. Um, walk, don't run, don't hold anything above your head. Remember our rotor disc is pretty high, but still you don't need to be holding things like way above your head. Um, remove hats, ball caps are a big thing. Take, take your ball cap, out, ball cap off, put it in your pocket, things like that. Uh, a helmet, like a fire helmet is fine. It's not going to blow away. Um, anything you have, uh, ask, ask the crew beforehand, um, one of the other kind of things that, that we talk about every once in a while is like, let's say we're walking to the helicopter and sand or something blows up in your eye, right? And so now you've got something in your eye. If that's the case, what I want you to do is take a knee and don't move. That's the international sign for us to know like, oh, that person can't see. I'm gonna, and now I'll, I'll double back as the flight medic and escort you away from the helicopter. That way you're not stumbling around looking, right? It was something in your eye and you walk somewhere you, you don't need to go. Um, again, our helicopter is very safe as far as those things are concerned because everything is very high up there off the ground. Our tail rotor is high up, our main rotor is high up, but still. Patient loading always occurs on the right side of the aircraft. Uh, if you're paying attention and you're looking at the helicopter, it's the side with the hoist. If you see the search light, you're on the wrong side. 
So the hoist is where the patients get loaded. The first line is not so much. Um, if we have a double, both patients get loaded from the right side of the aircraft. We will escort you, but that's just kind of the way it works. Um, the only other thing about that is, uh, I, I didn't mention this before, with a double patient, one of the two patients has to be backboarded, regardless of whether it's medically necessary. Now, what I mean with that is, as I mentioned earlier, if there's a two patients, one of the patients sits on brackets that the, the, the uh, backboard connects to brackets on the floor. That's how we restrain that patient. So that patient has to be boarded. Now they don't have to be fully spinally immobilized. You can put them on a board with some spider straps. That's good enough that you don't have to like do collar blocks and all that stuff unless it's indicated. Um, but they do have to be on a board for us to safely transport them. If it's not medically necessary for either one to be boarded, I would prefer that you board the lighter of the two patients because it's really kind of weird to get that backboard in there. Uh, the entrance there, the, the door is a little bit shorter than the backboard is long. So we have to lift the backboard kind of up and over. Uh, and that's a lot easier if you have a lighter patient. So uh, if you have a double, one of the two has to be boarded. And if there's no medical necessity, necessity for either one to be boarded, we prefer the lighter of the two to be boarded. So one of the key things that I wanna talk about here is time to meaningful intervention versus time to definitive care. Um, so we can, there are certain things with trauma patients that, are, that count as a meaningful intervention. And once we make that meaningful intervention, we do have to get to definitive care eventually but we've essentially paused the clock. One of the ways I like to think about this, right? Say you've got a, you know, a gunshot wound uh, just above the knee that's massively bleeding. Well, that's a big deal. Uh, and you can rapidly bleed to death from that. But once we have a tourniquet on, if that's the only, if that's the only injury, we've now temporized that a little bit and we have a little bit more time. Some of the reasons that we take a little bit longer on scene to do stuff is, right, we want to get that meaningful intervention on board. So for example, with a TBI patient, uh, with a patient with a traumatic brain injury, um, I don't want any at all hypoxia. So if they're not hypoxic, it may be better for me to take longer on scene by a couple minutes to RSI them so that they don't have, they don't uh, vomit in the aircraft, they don't aspirate, and uh, I can prevent them from ever being hypoxic. Um, if that's the case, right, that then is a meaningful intervention that we can perform on scene. Sometimes we bring those meaningful interventions with us. And so we have to think as, as pre-hospital providers, not necessarily about uh, where we're gonna get to the destination. So, right, from, you know, my ambulance, it's 20 minutes to the hospital. If the helicopter is coming with that meaningful intervention, with RSI, with potentially blood uh, in the near future, that now provides that meaningful intervention that we can start on scene. Um, and that might change the, the, the kind of, uh, uh, it, it might change the timeline a little bit for your patient. So while it may ultimately take a little bit longer to get to the hospital, if we are doing that meaningful intervention on scene, such as RSI, such as blood, maybe that's justified because we're bringing it to the scene. Does that make sense? Hope so. Um, one of the things that I wanna talk about is RSI. So RSI is one of the big things that we can do that uh, most ground EMS units can't. So I wanna give you just like, this isn't gonna be, I'm not trying to teach you how to RSI, but I wanna give you a little bit of familiarity with our process. So our standing orders for RSI are a GCS of less than or equal to eight with a respiratory, uh, with and the, way I, the way I phrase these two bullet points here is with respiratory failure. So a respiratory rate less than eight or greater than 35 or at SATs less, less than 90 on a non rebreather. Our medical directors also basically said if they're being bagged and they have a GCS less than eight, that, that counts. So in this case, those are gonna be the patients that we RSI. Those are also the patients that just in general need their airway protected. So once we've identified a patient that needs its airway protection, we have to figure out how we're gonna get that tube. So we have 
a couple a couple different options. We have a nasal intubation. We have oral intubation without drugs. That's what I call a crash intubation or just a cold intubation. Either way, that's just where I'm intubating a patient, but I don't have to provide them with any sedative or paralytic. Our decision tree is basically like, if they're not contraindicated and you can put in an NPA, you can probably nasally intubate them. We like to do nasal intubations. We do about a third of our intubations across the command nasally because they're significantly faster. And in a patient that's in extremis uh, or who's potentially in shock, I don't have to add a sedative or a paralytic into the mix, which is gonna affect their hemodynamics significantly, potentially significantly. Um, one of the key things about nasal intubation is that uh, the contraindication for nasal is not a head injury, it's signs and symptoms of a basal or skull fracture. And that's really important. If you hit me with a hammer in the back of my head and I've got a dent in my head up here, but my face is intact, I've got no bleeding behind the ears, I've got no blood from the ears, no blood from the nose, anything like that, I can put in a, nas uh, a, 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 a nasal tube uh, in that patient. That's safe to do so. That's a completely different story than a patient that's taken, uh, you know, a train to the face on an ATV where they were uh, unrestrained and they've got uh, a Laforte fracture, blood from the nose and uh, mastoid or uh, periodontal ecchymosis. In those cases where you've got a suspected head injury or massive mid-face trauma, yeah, I'm not putting anything in the nose. Um, but it's important to remember that distinction. Uh, we've had some in instances with ground providers where that's been a rub. They're like, hey, this is a head injury patient. You can't nasally tube them. And our guys are like, well, it's not a basilar skull fracture patient. And so we can. Um, so, right. So that's just one of the things to, that's, you know, one of the things to try and put us all on the same page on. Um, so if they're contraindicated for a nasal intubation and I can't open their mouth to do an oral intubation, then we RSI. So that's kind of our, our decision process. If we can't do nasal, if we can't do an oral, then we RSI. Um, if they can put in an OPA, or if, if we can put in an OPA, we can most likely put in uh, a normal cold, uh, you know, orotracheal intubation. Um, we also have LMAs as our uh, blind insertion airway device. Um, that's an option for us sometimes, right? If we have a patient that is uh, maybe they're taking an OPA when we arrive on scene, their airway is uncomplicated. Let's say they have gunshot wounds to like the chest or abdomen, and they're just super, super shocky. Um, there's nothing wrong with their airway, but we want to make sure that they don't aspirate or vomit or anything like that. We may, in that case, throw in an LMA because it's faster than trying to do anything else and then hustle the hustle to trauma. If you think we're going to need to RSI somebody, a couple of things that you can do. First of all, no DSAT. This is a procedure that we do all the time. Uh, right, it, it falls into the fundamentals of correcting hypoxia. So if you've got a patient that is hypoxic, their stats are low, the first thing that you do to fix that is to provide more oxygen. Once, you've been, once you're providing all the oxygen that you can possibly provide, the next thing is to recruit more alveoli, so to provide some PEEP. So no DSAT, that procedure starts that whole process. So if you think we're, if you're calling us and you think we're going to RSI that patient, you see these GCS less than eight, what I want you to do is put a nasal cannula on the patient. Uh, we used to run this at 15 liters a minute. Um, since COVID, we've been doing it at eight liters a minute just to reduce the amount of droplet precautions uh, or, or the, the amount of droplet spread. But you put a nasal cannula in their nose at eight liters per minute. And then if they're still breathing on their own, you put a non-rebreather and you crank it high as it'll go. So up to 25, if it'll go up to 25. Um, if not, do a BVM and assist their ventilations. What this will do is actually provide them with 100% uh, oxygen. The other thing I want you to do, uh, and this can be done, right? If you've got a conscious patient, don't, don't start tying down their hands. This can be done later. But if you've got um, a patient that we're intubating and you're in the ambulance with us, every patient that we intubate, we tie their hands down. Um, the intent there is so that uh, the intent there is so that if our sedation starts to wear off or if something happens, uh, if they start to wake up faster than we expect them to, they're not able to grab and pull at the tube. So somebody asked me the question about this earlier, and I, I really appreciate it. Uh, this is the load. This is the whole blood protocol. So this is going to be one of those things that will eventually come to the helicopter uh, as soon as we can get all the all the kinks worked out. Um, this is our this is our protocol for this. 
So these are, uh, right, you look at clinical suspicion for major blood loss. So this is penetrating injury to the trunk. And then with any of these signs of shock uh, as available by a, a lot of different mechanisms. So any of those cases, we can now start, uh, you know, once we get it on board, we can start blood. Um, what we're looking at carrying, uh, if we, you know, if all goes well and everything gets worked, it will be low titer O positive. So the way this works is uh, it is blood that is RH positive, but in a low, uh, a low concentration of that RH factor, which then makes it safe to administer it even to patients uh, with O negative. Essentially, the way this works is, uh, you know, right, if you have a, uh, a woman of childbearing age where you, we might, uh, you know, if we administer whole blood, uh, the, the low uh, O positive whole blood and she's O negative, she'll have to get Rogam if she ever gets pregnant. Um, but at the time that we're, if we're giving blood in the field, that patient is in immediate jeopardy of losing their life. And so in that case, the benefits outweigh the risks. Um, that's kind of the, the calculus that we're doing there. So this way, uh, with O positive whole blood, we aren't typing, we aren't doing anything like that. This is gonna be the universal donor blood. Uh, we're just gonna hang units as necessary um, in accordance with this protocol. Um, this is gonna come, I, I think I've got it on the next slide, but or in one of the later slides, but one of the key things here is that we have to think about what we're doing when we put crystalloid fluid into a patient. Crystalloid fluid does not replace anything that that patient has lost uh, you know when their blood is either on the on the pavement or in their abdomen or wherever it's not supposed to be so we need to start thinking about putting back what they've lost and in this case that's going to be blood so the the biggest thing here is you know I'm sure we'll publicize it we'll send it back out once we have blood on board the aircraft but once we do that does it, it should change a little bit the way that you think about calling for a helicopter, right? If we can get get to your patient and start blood before they would have arrived at the hospital otherwise, it might make sense for you to use air transport as opposed to ground transport because we have a meaningful intervention to provide to your patient. Um, understand that that's gonna be in the future. Uh, we don't have it yet. So a couple of things I like to term style points. These are things that we try to do um, that I'd like to talk about. I'd like to see you guys do. None of these are earth shattering. They are very basic stuff. A lot of trauma care is doing the basics right. You do the basics right, you save seconds, seconds save minutes, minutes save lives. Um, right? So one of the biggest things is fully exposed trauma patients. Uh, sometimes I, uh, I feel like I'm just really dumb with the number of times that I have to rele relearn this lesson sometimes. Um, but every patient, if they're significant enough to request a helicopter, if they're significant enough that you think they warrant transfer to a trauma center, do your absolute level best to expose them completely to search for additional injuries. I can't tell you the number of times, right? I remember one in particular, I had an elderly lady. She had a very trivial mechanism. Uh, she was, right, ground EMS had cut most of her clothes off and all that was left was her undergarments. And I was like, I don't need to remove any. It's fine. She looks fine. She feels fine. We're good. Uh, we get to the hospital. They remove them, and sure enough, under this, you know, uh, uh, under this bra that she was wearing, she had a huge bruise in her ribs. Um, that you know, pro you know, inconsequential. It's not going to change my care. She wasn't in shock. She wasn't hypotensive. Anything like that. But uh, you certainly look kind of dumb rolling in and being like, "Hey, everything's fine." And they're like, "Oh, did you see this?" No. So. It's one of the things to look at. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times, right? A another good example is a stabbing patient that I had. Um, the patient, the ground providers, everybody was saying that he got stabbed once, uh, but he hadn't, uh, his clothes hadn't been cut off and there was a lot of blood on him. So we start cutting off more things and the patient's like getting mad at us for cutting his clothes. And he's like, I only got stabbed once. And right about that time I found stab wound number two. And I was like, well, no, you think you got stabbed once, you got stabbed twice. We ended up finding a total of four on him. So it's important, even if your patient is conscious and saying, hey man, I only got stabbed once. Uh, I don't know, it's, it's hard to keep track of the number of times you've been stabbed, I guess. But it's, uh, right, that's not always reliable. You need to expose those trauma patients to really figure out what you're dealing with. That being said, if you're done assessing them, warm them back up. 
it is super important to keep trauma patients as warm as possible. Even in summertime, even in right when you think it's warm outside and you're like, ah, this doesn't need that much, you got to keep them warm. Hypothermia is one of the components of the trauma triad of death. Uh, you start getting a patient that is cold, their clotting factors don't work as well. They will bleed more. They'll become more acidotic. Everything kind of feeds into itself. And a lot of it starts with keeping that patient warm. We have a, a thing called a life blanket that we put on a lot of our, uh, almost all of our trauma patients, even in the summertime. It is essentially a sleeping bag with a body size chuck pad inside of it. Um, right? We wrap all of our patients in that. A lot of times we put a couple of warm blankets inside of it and then wrap them up. Um, this, I can't, I can't emphasize this enough. Keeping them warm is a simple, no effort intervention that will pay dividends for your trauma patients. Uh, aggressively stop bleeding. This isn't just tourniquet application. So tourniquets are great. Uh, we've seen a lot of tourniquet applications. We see a lot of like law enforcement bystander tourniquet applications. That's fantastic. Um, I'm not saying tourniquets for everything though. And one of the other things that we have to be considered of is there are certain junctional and uh, like at, you know, your groin, your axilla, places where a tourniquet is not gonna fix the issue. And some of the issues that we've run into, uh, you know, as helicopter crews coming in is they're like, hey, yeah, we dressed this wound and it's like a bulky dressing put on top of a big wound. That's only gonna serve as a sponge to pull more things out uh, if somebody has a big gaping like shark bite type wound and they are bleeding profusely from it and you can't put a tourniquet on, you have to get into that wound, pack it and put a pressure dressing on. Um, that's what quick clots for. That's what your Israeli bandages are for. You've got to get in there. Is that going to be painful for the patient? Yes, absolutely. Um, but you have to do it to save their life. You really got to get uh, down, to the, down to the source of bleeding as best you can and put direct pressure on it. Um, quick word about junctional tourniquets while we're on there as you're like, oh, there's junctional tourniquets out there. There's been a, a our tactical medical unit, uh, which is a, a small group of our flight medics that work with our SWAT teams. Uh, they've done a lot of good work with Hopkins, uh, testing and trialing every commercially available junctional tourniquet. All of them pretty much work, uh, just as effectively as somebody putting pressure on the, on the junction. So if you think about where your uh, inguinal crease is, kind of where those major arteries run down through, just taking somebody, one person, and putting two-hand pressure as hard as you can on that spot. If you've got a major injury to the leg that is just, uh, you can't fix it with a tourniquet and they're bleeding all over the place, that's one of the key steps to take. Delegate, delegate somebody to put that junctional pressure on, slow the bleeding down, then you can pack, you can put your pressure dressings on, and with that uh, junctional pressure, you might stand a good chance of stopping it. The other, the final thing that I'll say about this is a pelvic binder is bleeding. If I've got a patient with a mechanism that suggests uh, uh, maybe a, a pelvic injury and they look to be shocky on their vital signs, they get in a pelvic binder, particularly if they're unconscious. So the way this looks, right, you got a 20 year old male hit by a car, uh, his pressure is 60 over 40, he's tacking at 130. Uh, I don't care if he can talk to me. I don't care if the pelvis feels stable. He's going to get a pelvic binder. Um, I would like to reduce the size of that pelvis. If I get to the hospital and it's nothing and there's nothing there, they can take it right off. It's not a big deal, particularly if you do it right. Uh, what, I, what I say with doing it right, remember, uh, we're not centering the pelvic binder on the iliac crests. They need to be at the, uh, at the head of the femur. So it needs to be almost a little bit lower, kind of where you feel the... Uh, if you were to feel up the side of your leg, right when you get to where your hip bone is, is essentially where that thing needs to be uh, situated, not higher up, right, uh, on, on, the, on the pelvis itself. If you put it too high, you have a tendency, you have a, a chance of actually opening the pelvis worse and making bleeding worse. So cheat low, um, right, if, if, even if you put it like down too low around the legs, it will still close the volume of the pelvis, assuming that you're not having massive fractures there in the legs uh, that are preventing that. Another thing that you can do is just uh, tie their feet and ankles together and up. That will also help reduce the volume of the pelvis. Um, doing those simple things will help, uh, help get hemorrhage control, particularly in those patients that like, they're gonna be very difficult to control otherwise. Hey, Adam. Yes. So we have a great question in the chat. It says, do you fly codes only after yes. OSC? 
so we will fly ROS codes in general. Um, I would say if we are inbound and your patient arrests, let us come in and help you. Um, if we get a patient back, we'll take them. Sometimes, uh, right, particularly like if we've landed and started taking care of a, a patient and like the patient arrests and it's a trauma arrest, protocol technically says you were not supposed to take trauma arrests in the helicopter. But realistically, they're gonna arrive at the, right, let's just say you got a patient up on, you know, Liberty Road, you're landing us somewhere and uh, the patient goes into trauma arrest. Well, if we're landing, and we can help you get that patient to shock trauma in the same time that it would take you to just drive to like Northwest, who's not a trauma center and not gonna be prepared for that. Um, that patient, if they're gonna survive anywhere, it's gonna be a shock trauma. Um, in that case, right, we can help you bridge that gap. In particular, you know, as I mentioned again, once we get blood, blood is one of those interventions where you had a trauma code, we start pushing blood, maybe we'll get them back. So. If we're close enough, right? If, I mean, if we're 15 minutes away and your patient trauma codes, um, there's not much we can do about that. But if we're close, let us come in and help you. Um, one of the things that we can do in outlying, in outlying areas, depending on where you work, uh, if anybody works outside of Baltimore County, is we can do a hot ED transfer. So the way this works sometimes is your patient will trauma code, they will take the patient to the local facility we will meet them at the local facility, assist the local facility in care, and then arrange for an uh, immediate interfacility transfer to a trauma center. So once we're involved in your call, we can help you a significant amount in getting that patient to a better outcome. So even if they code, if we're close, let us come in, let us help you, um, right? You know, if it's if it's non-survivable, uh, we take it to the local facility, they declare it, and we, we go back in service. Um, but if there's a if there's a chance, we want to give that patient the best chance as possible for survival. So yes, uh, we will help you with the code. We'll help you run it. Um, depending on the situation, we may take it and transport it, or we may end up going by ground. But if that case, if that's the case, we'll assist you in that whole process. Um, so for this side, limit crystalloid fluid. So I alluded to this with the blood. Um, crystalloid fluid lactated ringers does not have clotting factors. It does not have uh, oxygen carrying capacity. So it does not replace anything that you lose by bleeding. I hope at this point in, in, in EMS, you know, it's 2021. Uh, I hope that, you know, right, the scenario of me getting into the back of the ambulance and the medic looking at me like, hey, Troop, uh, we got your patient here. They had like one soft blood pressure, like 90. So we got two 14s and they're on their third liter of fluid. I hope that sounds wrong to everybody that's listening. Um, crystalloid fluid should be it, it viewed as uh, it's the lesser of evils. So if you don't have blood, if you don't have products to give, hey, you got to do what you got to do to maintain perfusion. But that should be done in very small doses and with, uh, with an appropriate end game in, 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 in mind. So for example, I titrate uh, crystalloid fluids based on like a systolic blood pressure and their, but primarily their radial pulse and their mentation. So if I've got somebody that's shocky, that is maybe like getting a little like drowsy, getting a little somnolent, I can see their mentation getting worse. I might give them like a 250 cc bolus and see if it comes up. If it comes up, they get a little better, cool. I'll stop that fluid at 250. If I start seeing them go back down again, now I can give them another 250. But I'm giving it in very small doses and only to achieve a specific like physiological target. So the return of a radial pulse or an improvement of mentation. The reason I say this is because like blood pressures a little bit, uh, right? We know that they're variable from person to person. So a blood pressure of 90 in me versus a blood pressure of 90 in somebody that has chronic hypertension and lives hypertensive are two different things. So let's take something and let's guide our resuscitation, at least in the pre-hospital environment, based on something that's physiologically uh, observable at the, at the bedside. So capillary refill time, their uh, radial pulses, their, uh, uh, their mentation. Kind of guide it based on that, give only as much as you absolutely have to to maintain those things without you know, running two liters into them wide open. Uh, running two liters in wide open is not helpful. It is harmful. Um, you should be giving only what you have to to maintain perfusion. But again, if that's all you have, you got to give some. 
but like you said, it, it's the lesser of evils. Limit what you well, limit what you have to get. Uh, so elevate the head. So in particular for uh, patients with increased cranial pressure, take that guy that I mentioned earlier that has a hammer to the back of the head. Um, that is a closed head injury. If he doesn't have any trauma anywhere anywhere else, and you're not worried about him being hypovolemic overall, kick the head of the bed up to about 30 degrees. You can do this on an ambulance stretcher with a backboard. The whole backboard will just tilt. That's fine. That will help you with airway management, right? That puts gravity a little bit on your side so things aren't passively regurgitating out of the esophagus and into the posterior pharynx. Um, and that will also help you a little bit to decrease ICP. Um, like I said, these are very simple things, but it, it does, it pays off in the end. This one's super important, particularly if you call in a helicopter, be ready for transfer of care. Uh, I know sometimes calls are, calls go sideways and we're not going to have any information. You're going to be like, sorry, man, I don't know who this guy is. He's John Doe. He's just beat up. Take him, take him to shock trauma quick. Um, that's fine. In those cases that you have the time, take the time to plant, to prep, uh, figure out what your story is going to be, what your handoff is going to be, write up a short form for us so that we can take that immediately. I don't have to try and get that information back again. Um, in particular, any sort of medical history information. If there's any potential case of a stroke, it's super important for you guys uh, to, you know, to get that last known well and get that information for contact of the family. Because remember, we don't have the benefit of actually going into the scene. A lot of times we get things and the, the medics that's there and they want to tell me all sorts of things about the car and how bad the car was. And let me be wrong, that stuff's useful. But sometimes I look at the patient and I'm like, uh, I, I guess the car's broken, but the patient seems fine. But those things, right, I, you lose so much, right? Because I, like, I, I volunteer at Pikesville. I still run the calls on the ground. It's a totally different world walking into the call halfway. And so if there are key details, like from the vehicle, if there's key details uh, from the scene, make sure you've got a way to pass that on. Uh, I love pictures of the car that the patient came from, particularly if it's a mechanism flight, because then I arrive at the hospital and all the, you know, right, if I'm, if I'm kind of questioning you like, oh, this patient seems fine. And you're like, no, the car was destroyed. All I can do is pass that on to the hospital. So I guarantee you I'm getting the same questions from the hospital. So if you can show me like, now the car was destroyed. Here's the intrusion in the passenger compartment. Here's where the patient was sitting. Here's what hit him. Those kind of things can get uh, can be super helpful to me and to pass on to the medical to, to the medical facilities later on. Um, all the other things is uh, right. Expect us right just to give you an idea of how our transfer of care is going to go. One of our medics is going to come in the side door at the head of the patient. The other is going to come in the back door at the foot of the patient. That medic that's at the head of the patient is the one you need to be talk to, talking to. They're running the call. Regardless of which one of the two is senior, they're the ones running the call if they're at the head. Um, the way that our transfer of care does, uh, our medic at the head assesses the airway, uh, the chest, gets the story from the uh, ground providers, and basically does everything from the waist up. The medic at the foot immediately comes in, takes your monitor off, puts our monitor on, and then does the waist down. Um, then we kind of meet in the middle and, uh, right. We, we talk about what we have so that everybody's on the same page, right, right, Our two medics. Um, right. And then that allows us to kind of play off each other. If we walk in, my partner's at the head of the bed and it's, and they're elbow deep in the airway immediately, I may take over most of running the call to let them secure the airway. I may do a lot more of, I may do more of assessment moving up past the waist, but that's just a, a right a general way of how we operate. Um, and one of the things that I like to point out is that like, we are pretty regimented into this way uh, of operating. We train to it very rigorously. Um, so one of those things, one of the things that this allows is even on a really bad call, we kind of both know what our partner is gonna do, even if I've never flown with that person before. Um, this is an important part of a shared mental model that makes these like calls go smoothly. I can walk in from somebody from a right, you know, trooper five that I haven't seen in years or I may have never met before. And we can walk in immediately and go out on a bad call or a hoist or whatever. And because we've all been trained the same way and have the same functioning, uh, right? I know if I'm walking in at the foot of the, at the foot of the ambulance, my responsibility is to put on the monitors, control major hemorrhage from the lower half of the body and report back to my partner who's running the call. Um, so that's just kind of the, 
you know, the, the way that the way that we tend to do things. Um, trying to think of anything else that falls into this. Uh, oh, one other big thing that falls into this. Sometimes you see this. I like it when you guys keeping the patient warm and, and thinking ahead like this. But please do not secure a blanket underneath spider straps. Um, that's one of my pet peeves. It drives me nuts because then it's so hard to reassess that patient. We are going to have to take everything off, do a quick assessment head to toe, and then put everything back on. So uh, we run into this sometimes. They get put in the back of the ambulance. A warm uh, the ground EMS strips them, does their assessment, puts a warm blanket on them, and then secures it with spider straps. And it looks super tidy. It's super neat, uh, but it gets in the way. Um, put that blanket on top. When we're moving to the helicopter, we can either secure it inside of the life blanket or put a seatbelt over top of it. And that'll keep it from blowing away and becoming a hazard. Adam, there's a question. Do you have a separate medical director? Do you have a separate scope of practice that we may not be aware of? No, so we have the same paramedic scope of practice that uh, everybody else does. The only thing that we have is like some, some optional protocols. So we have the adult and pediatric optional protocols. Um, the only other thing that we have is um, our, our medical director is very involved with us. So uh, every time we RSI some patient, uh, a patient, we, before the end of the shift, have a phone call and review that case with the medical director every single time. Um, anytime we have a priority one patient, uh, both it, it gets reviewed both internally by uh, uh, a crew chief at a different section, but also by our safety officer and our medical director. So because of that, like kind of tight control and the, there's so few of us, there's, I mean, there's less than a hundred uh, MSP medics across the command and only about half of those are crew chiefs. So there's such a small number of us, we have uh, just a little bit more trust to make, uh, right? I, I personally feel like super empowered to make, to make decisions as necessary and uh, not, not at all to violate protocols, but just I, I feel that I have I feel that I have leeway, and I don't feel like anybody's breathing down my neck or going to go after me for something if I'm making decisions in the best interest of the patient. Um, the other thing there is that we we do get orders all the time from shock trauma. Um, if we're calling orders on the trauma line, um, right, because of that professional relationship we've built with them, it's super easy. Um, we usually get what we ask for. Um, one of the key things there is uh, consults. I mean, consults are a whole different world. But you have to know what you're asking for and you have to ask for it with uh you have to convey that confidence to the person on the other end of the radio because if you go hey uh what do you want me to do they're probably going to say nothing bring them to me um if you say hey i my plan is to do this do you concur they're like yeah sounds like a good plan so i work under the same protocols as you guys uh we sometimes have a little bit more leeway with our ability to get orders and receive orders um, right, because of that institutional kind of trust between us and trauma and, and, and the tra other trauma receiving facilities, uh, and then our, our kind of close uh, contact with the medical director. There's times where like on a call, I will call our medical director and be like, hey, right, for example, that patient that I mentioned earlier where I was, uh, we had to make the emergency landing in an outlying facility. My original plan was to land, get a, a, an ambulance from the local county and then try and get blood from the receiving from the outlying facility, but not actually go into the outlying facility. I called our medical director from sitting on their helipad and said, hey, this is what I wanna do. Can I take their blood if they give it to me? And he said, yep, like they have to spike. You know, he gave me a couple rules, they have to spike, da, 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 but you have the orders you need, go do what you need to do. Um, so we have a very responsive medical director. So it's one of those things, we don't have any special protocols but we just are able to operate within them more efficiently. At least I think. So I have two cases here. These should illustrate a couple of the points that I've been talking about. Um, these are cases that are uh, you know, similar to stuff that I've, that I've flown uh, with, you know, uh, obviously any sort of uh, information omitted. Um, and these can be anywhere in the state. So you have no idea who this is, um, but, these are, uh, you know, similar calls that, to, to what we get. So in this case, we have a 25-year-old male with a gunshot wound to the head. Uh, you have an obvious entry with powder stippling around the left temple. The left orbit is swollen and unstable. He's unable to open the eye. Blood draining from the nose and mouth. He's able to groan, but he doesn't talk. 
So as, as you enter the back of the ambulance, if you, you, know, you put yourself in, in, in the shoes of the flight medic, he's able to sit up under his own power. But if you can see me on the, on the video, you kind of see he's kind of like, you know, he's somnolent. And if you, if you talk to him, you like, uh, you know, he'll groan a little bit. He's not GCS of 15, but he's able to hold himself up and he's able to, right? And, but he's got continuous upper airway hemorrhage. So in this case, we're coming in, um, you know, think about what you would do with that patient on the ground. Um, I've had patients like this from when I worked on the ground in North Carolina, where, uh, you know, very similar situation to this gunshot wound to the head with massive upper airway hemorrhage. And RSI was not an option at all. We didn't have, oh, we weren't allowed to, I wasn't even allowed to intubate. All I had was a King airway, um, no RSI, no crike, just a King airway. And that was not the appropriate decision for this patient. So sometimes you just have to make do with what you got. Um, in that case, right, try and get this guy and keep him sitting up as much as we can. We were able to talk him through despite his like, uh, you know, inability to, um, to communicate really well. Turns out he didn't want to talk because his hard palate was broken. Um, but, you know, we we're able to put a suction catheter in his hand and say, hey, like, this is like that thing in the dentist, but just worse. So like suction yourself. And we we're able to talk him through it. And he was able to suction himself, assist in clearing his own airway. That also gives me a really good idea. I can pace it so I can see like, hey, once he's not doing that, once he's not participating, now we're starting to move down south. And now we're starting to move to the area where I may want to, where I may need to take the airway. This is another good example of where like discretion is the better part of valor. Uh, as we were coming in for this, ground EMS is like, hey, you guys are gonna have to RSI him. Um, and it's nothing against ground EMS, right? We're, we're trained and drilled very heavily on who to RSI and who not to. Um, in this case, he didn't meet those standing orders. His GCS was a 10 over eight um, and he didn't have any of those respiratory patterns. And while I could call and get orders to RSI him for outside, that's a case where I want nothing to do with that airway unless I'm forced to do it, right? Massive upper airway hemorrhage. Um, as soon as I lay him back and try and push any drugs, that's gonna go very south very quickly. Um, so it's one of those things, uh, you know, discretion, discretion is the better part of valor in this case. Maybe if we can keep him maintaining where he is and not intervene, that's potentially a better option. Because anything that we do in the field, right? It's important to remember, we're not the hospital. What's, a, what's an appropriate decision with the same patient in a hospital setting is not the appropriate decision uh, in the back of the ambulance or the back of the aircraft. In this case, right, I deferred intubating him, didn't do anything. The minute we got to the receiving facility, they had to try and intubate him, right? They have to because they are ultimately responsible for his definitive care. I have the luxury as a paramedic of going, I don't really want to touch that. I'm going to let them deal with it when they have more time, space, resources, and options. And ultimately, like, right, I, you know, as soon as we got to the receiving facility, uh, an attempt was made, which was entirely necessary, but it ended in a, in a, in a, in a crime. Um, that's an option that we have to do in the, that we have in the field with MSP aviation. We can crike people, we can crike adults, we can crike peds. Um, but it's not something that we want to do lightly. And it's certainly not something that I want to walk myself into. Um, Right. If I'm doing a crike, I want to do it because the patient dictated it, not because I decided to get a little uh, excited and, and try and do what I can. So case number two, this is a MVC with entrapment guardrail through the passenger compartment into the leg. Uh, so mangled lower extremities, tentative palpation of the pelvis, uh, crepitus to the left chest, GCS of five and a bruise on the forehead. So this is a patient where rapid, immediate and aggressive hemorrhage control is going to be key. In this case, right, if that, if, that mangle, if that mangled extremity is too high for a tourniquet, you might need to put junctional pressure. But that's also going to be complicated by the fact that they've got a tenderness and potentially unstable pelvis. So a pelvic binder is going to be super important. That junctional pressure is going to be super important. But that packing of the wound to try and get early hemorrhage control, the longer you let blood seep out of that dressing, the longer until you get hemorrhage control, the more the worse off that patient's going to be in terms of uh, getting into shock and in terms of uh, losing blood and, uh, and not doing well. They've got a bruise on their forehead. If they've got no mid-face trauma with a GCS of five, that's a good candidate to nasally intubate. In that case, right, I, with a GCS of five, I probably can't get an OPA. I probably can't put in an LMA. 
But if I've got an extended flight to the receiving facility, right? If it's a short flight, I might be comfortable taking them and just BVM ventilation or a high flow non rebreather and letting the hospital take care of it in favor of a more rapid transport. But in this case, the you know the the easy way might actually be to do a nasal intubation, protect that airway from getting any worse uh, in the fastest way possible. <clears throat> So this patient was heavily entrapped with a 15 to 20 minute extrication time. Um, so, you know, in Baltimore County, I, I think it would be very hard to justify a helicopter inside of the beltway of Baltimore County, um, right? But there's some places that realistically like very close, um, you know, just on the other side of the beltway or just, you know, some place in the county where like, in this patient, it's gonna be 15 to 20 minutes before they're extricated. And that's from the time that the, the rescue arrives, gets set up, and, and gets started in the cutting. In that case, the first engine on scene, the first officer, the first medic, if somebody early on calls this helicopter, that now changes your decision. And I want you guys to think about this, right? Because there's some place in the county where you're like, hey, it's a 15 minute drive to Sinai. That 15 minute drive doesn't start until you get the patient out of the, uh, out of the vehicle and moved and then at the end of it, you're, right, you're talking about uh, you know, a level two trauma center. The difference is if you can get that helicopter on the ground close enough for us to participate in patient care and to start that care before extrication is complete and move directly to the helicopter or move, uh, right, right, maybe, maybe we have to take the ambulance to the landing zone, but we've already done our initial assessment and handover. The patient's already on our monitor. That now suddenly turns a 15 minute transport, which is a good transport, right? Nice and easy, but that might turn a 15 minute transport into a three to five minute transport by air. So calling early gives you the opportunity to, to, to save, right? Save seconds, save minutes, save lives, right? You might have the option to get the helicopter on the ground, ready to go and, uh, and, and facilitate the rapid transfer of your patient by air. And the other thing to remember is that if that's not the best option, right, you can start the helicopter early on. If the extrication doesn't take 15 minutes, you can cancel us at any point. So I want you guys to think about it, particularly think about it early. Um, we are still an option anywhere in the county. Uh, if you can justify it, if it is in the best interest of the patient, you got no problems with us. So um, the, other, the only other thing that I'll say about that, though, is... Uh, there's probably, there's very few places in Baltimore County that you should be waiting on the helicopter. Uh, if you are packaged in the ambulance and ready to go and you have a, and you have a, you know, less than 15 to 20 minute transport, um, you should be thinking hard about where the helicopter is versus where you are about whether or not that's necessary. But if you've called early enough, this can, it, it can still work. So last thing, uh, we've had nine members of the Maryland State Police Aviation Command that have died in the line of duty. Um, so uh, a fixed wing aircraft and uh, four different helicopter crashes over the history of our, uh, of the history of our command, last one being in 2008. Um, the last thing I say about this is that, you know, this is air, the air medical profession in general is hazardous. Um, you know, it's uh, what goes up must come down and we have to operate these aircraft safely. And the safety of the aircraft and the crew does take primary, uh, you know, paramount over everything else. Um, there are going to be times where we're not going to be able to get to your, your patient's going to need us, but we're not going to be able to get to you. Um, but this is why we do it, right? Some of these crashes have been, I mean, most of these crashes have been in bad weather. Um, so we are, you know, naturally a little bit of a, a little bit averse. Right, this aircraft, this airframe has more capabilities than any of our previous aircraft by you know, light years, but uh, it's uh, it's not something that we take lightly. This is our contact information. Uh, the only last thing that I'll say uh, about uh, about everything I hear is that uh, we uh, we are recruiting. We're always recruiting. Uh, if you want to if you want to come join us, um, you're happy to. You know, my my contact information will be on here. Um, you're welcome to reach out to me. Uh, we look for, like I said, three to five years of ALS experience, but if you've got a paramedic card, we'll consider you and we will do what we can to train you in-house. Our in-house training program is very robust. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, the 
you guys can see all the numbers and all that other stuff about our pay and benefits. But the best thing I'll tell you is that you're not running 10 calls a day and you're not right waiting an hour and a half for a bed at Northwest. Um, we typically drop them off and roll on, uh, keep on rolling. So um, compared to being a ground medic, uh, I mean, I, I like playing on the ground ambulance. Uh, I enjoy my, my shifts riding at Pikesville, but uh, this, uh, this, you can't beat this. It's the uh, best job in the world. Uh, most days, I don't even, it doesn't even feel like work. So if anybody has any questions, let me know. That was great, Adam. That was great. So many practical tips and yeah, just great. Good. Well, I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. Hey, you guys, don't forget, Ashley put in the, um, there are some questions coming in, but Ashley put uh, in the chat the link to get your CMEs. Uh, she'll post that again. Any plans for MSP to lift, modify? Uh, yeah, so we are, we are working to gather data on how many of our eligible applicants we're losing because of that. Um, okay. One of the issues that we run into is that as in our recruiting software and our uh, system, basically people see that and then they don't bother filling out any sort of thing. And so we have no way of knowing how many qualified applicants we're losing because of our tattoo policy. I suspect it's quite a few. Uh, that's one of the biggest things. Uh, the two things that disqualify people from being troopers all the time is tattoos and marijuana.